Okay, there might be still a few people joining, but we'll make a start. Um, thank you to everyone that's joined this morning for this uh, this webinar on heavy duty water pumps, which is Gates uh, new product range. Uh, my name's Jason Ford. Okay, so we'll make a start. Okay, so on the agenda today for the Fleet Gates Fleet Runner heavy duty water pump range is the working principle the fleet runner range, mechanical seals, mechanical water pumps, electromagnetic clutch water pumps, coolant system flushing and the importance of flushing the systems, coolant because obviously coolant is a big factor of the cooling system, coolant filters which we don't generally see on car applications but in the commercial vehicle uh, market uh, coolant filters are used quite regular and some typical water pump failures. Okay, so we all know that water pumps are the critical component that keep liquid flowing throughout the cooling system. Internal combustion engines burn fossil fuels to generate energy and power. Approximately one third of this energy is then used to actually move the vehicle. The remaining two thirds of this energy converts into excessive heat. One third of the heat transfers through the exhaust system and out into the atmosphere. The remaining third of the heat is transferred into the engine. Now a heat fluid, uh, a heat transfer fluid, sorry, is then required to absorb this heat that's retained within the engine and the fluid transfers the heat to the, radi to the radiator, which then dissipates the heat out into the atmosphere. And the water pump's role is to ensure coolant flow is maintained within the system. However, approximately 40 to 50% of engine downtime relates to failures within the coolant system. Therefore, correct system maintenance is key to preventing costly repairs. Okay, so the Gates Fleet Runner range contains two types of water pumps. We have what's called a mechanical water pump, very similar to the car market water pumps. And we have electromagnetic clutch water pumps. As you can see, the clutch mechanism on the electromagnetic clutch water pump contains a, an electromagnetic clutch contained within the pulley. And here we can see cooling fins, which are required to obviously call the system, the internals of the system, as the pulley is rotating, etc., And also you'll just notice here, there's an electronic plug, which obviously uh, a, a, a wiring loom on the vehicle will connect to here to supply power to the electronics within this pulley mechanism. But the, um, the power is only supplied at certain temperature ranges within the uh, coolant system. So mechanical water pumps, the water pump is driven by the accessory V-belt, the micro V-belt, whatever we want to call it. And the pulley is constantly fixed to the water pump shaft. So obviously, as the pulley is fixed to the shaft, on the other end of the shaft is the impeller because it's circulating the coolant within the system. So therefore, the water pump speed is linked to the engine speed, even at low engine temperatures. With the electromagnetic clutch water pumps, the water pump is not linked to engine speed, even though it's still connected via the accessory V-belt or the micro V-belt. Now, we still have the pulley and the shaft, but also incorporated in this system is the electromagnetic clutch mechanism, which engages or disengages dependent on the coolant temperature. So the clutch mechanism consists of a rotor disc, a magnetic carrier and a calling ring, which contains the calling things as we saw in the previous picture earlier in the presentation. Now, this is obviously, this illustration is shown exploded view for uh, training purposes and the rotor disc and magnetic carrier will be inside the pulley. So the me this me mechanism is contained with inside the pulley. The only bit that seems that will you you will see sticking out externally is the cooling ring and the fins on the cooling ring. Okay, so when the clutch is off, 
at normal operating temperature or at normal operation, the permanent magnet carrier turns at approximately 60% of the belt and the pulley's rotation. So it's 60% because the rotor disc is not energized, which means there's no power supply because the coolant temperature is low. Now, what we need to remember here is a lot of these type of systems have been manufactured and designed to help with emissions. So because at one, when the uh, coolant temperature is low, the engine temperature is low, with having the rotor disc only rotating 60% of the time, therefore the shaft is only rotating 60% of the time. On the other end of the shaft is the impeller. If the impeller isn't rotating 100%, it means the coolant isn't being circulated as often. Therefore, it aids with helping to warm the engine up quicker, which helps with emission-related uh, issues. Okay, so when the clutch is on, so when the coolant temperature becomes to a certain temperature, obviously sensors sense the temperature, send a signal to the ECU, ECU sends a signal to uh, the permanent magnets uh, and supply power. The pump is then coupled to the rotor disc, so then the permanent magnet carrier is now will now ensure 100% uh, output. So as we can see, when the clutch is off, the rotor disc and magnetic carrier are disengaged. When power supplied, when the, the temperature has uh, risen and got to a certain temperature range, power supplied, the rotor disc and magnetic carrier are coupled together, they're engaged together, which then engages obviously the shaft. So the shaft is rotating 100% of the time as the pulley is being driven by the micro V belt, the accessory drive belt. And obviously on the other end, we have the impeller. The impeller is then circulating the coolant 100% of the time because the engine is at an operating temperature and it needs to be brought at too high operating temperature and needs to be brought back to normal operating temperature. At normal operating temperature, obviously we maintain best fuel consumption, etc. best emissions. And obviously the cooling ring is incorporated. And obviously as, we, as stated before, all this mechanism is contained inside the actual pulley. Okay, so just a bit of a, an explosive view of a mechanical water pump, it's in components, the anatomy of a, a mechanical water pump. We have the pulley or the drive mechanism, a shaft, we have the pump housing, a seal is normally incorporated to use to seal against the, obviously the engine block. We have the bearing, which is to support the shaft, a mechanical seal, which we'll be discussing later, and obviously the impeller, which circulates the coolant. So some things we need to be mindful of is with the um, water pumps, we can see a cross section here. We have a vent hole at the top and something called a weep hole. Now a weep hole is, as you can see there, a small drilled hole usually found at the lowest point of the pump when it's in its mounted position on the engine. Now small amounts of coolant leaking from this weep hole is normal, particularly at startup after installation. After the installation period and the running period, then the, uh, the weeping will stop. Now, many pumps also have uh, a weep hole chamber, as we can see here, which is like a reservoir to catch and evaporate the coolant after it's passed through the mechanical seal during the actual initial startup and running in procedure. If large amounts of coolant are leaking from here, then an internal water pump seal has failed and the pump will need to be replaced. But this, the failure of this seal can be due to a couple of things which we're going to discuss. It can due, be due to installation procedures and also contamination within the coolant system. So again, we have a cross-section of a mechanical seal. Now the mechanical seal contains a seat cup, a spring, a bellows, a retainer, a sleeve, and the two seals. We have a, what we call a static ring seal and a dynamic ring seal. And it's the faces in between these two seals that we need to protect from damage and contamination. 
another sideways view of the of the uh, mechanical seal. Now we have what we call a static seal, as we said, static seal, which is connected to um, the retainer side of the um, mechanical seal. The retainer, this section here, is pushed into the body of the water pump, hence static. Now the static seal does not rotate. However, due to the spring pressure, it does move actually along the axis of the bearing shaft to produce continuous contact with the dynamic seal. Now the dynamic seal rotates with the bearing shaft, so the bearing shaft will be through here, through the sleeve section here. So obviously when the uh, drive is rotated, the shaft rotates, the pulley rotates, etc., and the impeller rotates, unless you've got the, the electromagnetic clutch, as we discussed earlier. But the difference between the two seals is one is static, it's held stationary, and the other rotates when the shaft rotates. That's called the dynamic seal. So we need coolant, a small amount of coolant, to pass through these seal faces because coolant has got glycol contained within in the solution. Glycol acts as a very good lubricant and cooling aid for the mechanical seals. What we have to remember is we've got the spring pressure pushing the static ring onto the dynamic seal, but we've also got hydraulic pressure from the coolant, which will be forcing against this, uh, this place here to push the dynamic seal also against the static seal. The coolant will produce a very thin film between the two seal faces. As we said previous, the coolant contains glycol, which acts as a coolant and a cooling aspect and lubricating aspect to keep this, the seal faces protected. However, if we get contamination within the coolant in any shape or form, we can start to cause damage to these seal faces because the gaps are very, very small. And if we get damage to the seal faces, we get continuous leakage and then the pump, the complete pump will need to be replaced. So water pump seal damage, the, the seal failure is the leading cause of water pump claims. And over 95% of failed seals had clear and visible evidence of coolant system contamination. Now contaminants as small as 50 microns or 0.05 millimeters in diameter can cause seal failure. On average, in general, a seal face is around about 2,000 microns, two millimetres in thickness. 50 microns or 0.05 millimetre contaminants is around about the thickness of the hair on your head. But if we start to get buildup of these contaminants on these seal faces, then we can start to cause damage to the seal, score marks in the seal, which is irreversible, and then we call, it causes leakage problems. So here we can see a new sealing ring surface. Now these seals are manufactured to very, very high tolerances. So it's virtually like a polished, polished sort of finish on the, on the seal surface. And here we can see contaminants are starting to de deposit on the sealing ring surface. And here we can see that contamination has caused score marks in the surface of the sealing ring. Remember, one is a static seal and one's rotating. So here we can see leakage paths on the seal with this, the score marks actually is what we call leakage paths because the seal face is damaged. If this occurs within the water pump, then unfortunately it's irreversible damage and the me mechanical seal will continue to leak and the water pump will need replacing. Also, you can just see a picture. We can see an overheating of the sealing ring surface and see the discoloration throughout. This is due, could be due to either the coolant um, level is low in the vehicle or during the installation process, coolant hasn't been drawn in between the seal faces to act as obviously a lubricant and to cool the sealing ring surfaces prior to the engine being started. If this does happen, obviously the overheating, heat damage causes irreversible damage to the seal and the uh, water pump will need to be replaced also. So Gates has a 
what we call a power clean flush tool, part number 91002, which safely flushes complete cooling systems using water and compressed air. When you pull the trigger, you get a pulsating wave action of water, which agitates and cleans rust, scale and solid deposits from radiators, engine blocks and heater cores. Now, this all has to be done prior, obviously, to new water pump installation. Regulator, you can see this section here, this little black, black unit, maintains constant 28 PSI uh, of pressure what, during the cleaning process. So mechanical seal damage, as we said previous, cooling system flushes ensures harmful solid and particles are removed from the cooling system to prevent these solid particles from causing damage to the mechanical seal faces. Now, Gates carried out some flush uh, testing. Firstly, there's, there's, there's three flushes, an engine flush, a heater core flush, and a radiator flush. First, each flush was done using a garden hose and on um, each flush using the garden hose, a, a clean white cloth was used to capture any contamination entering that section of the system. As you can see, by using the garden hose, which is reliant on pressure, mains pressure, tap water pressure, you can see that there is evidence of contamination which has been flushed out of the system. However, when the power clean flush tool is used, because you've got that 28 PSI of pressure, which agitates and cleans better, you can see that there's more contamination has been removed from the system. Now, re please remember when the power clean flush tool was used, a new piece of white cloth was used to capture what was coming out when the power clean flush was done, comparing against what has come out by just using the garden hose. So you can see that extra pressure and the agitation helps to remove more of that contamination. The more contamination that's removed from the system will help and aid, um, you know, stop premature failure of mechanical seals due to, to hard contamination that may be present within the system. Now, left unattended, these, if, if, uh, Mechanical seals are left, if they are leaking and they continuously leaking, what can actually happen is it can block the um, seals within the water pump and it can back up in the bearing housing. If the coolant is back, starts backing up in the bearing housing, then obviously the bearing contains grease. The grease, the, the coolant can actually wash the grease away. If the grease is washed away, there's no... no uh, lubrication, etc., for the bearing, and it can also cause, you know, the, the shaft to drop if the bearing's damaged, etc. So a seized water pump can lead to a broken ABDS belt or, ex or auxiliary belt, accessory drive belt, and it can lead to overheating. If excessive overheating, obviously, can lead to catastrophic engine damage also. So we need to ensure if this, if any leakage is noticed, we need to you know, do the maintenance as soon as possible on the system to ensure these types of things don't happen. So a clean cooling system enables more efficient engine cooling because everything's moving correctly and flowing correctly. Quicker engine warm-up, which leads to better fuel consumption, longer lasting components, reduced comebacks to the workshop, which obviously leads to an increase in customer confidence also. So please remember, if in doubt, flush out the system. Coolant system flushing, preferably using the Gates Power Clean Flush Tool, part number 91002. So installation of water pumps. Now, Gates provides water pumps for a large selection of automobile applications. This is for the heavy-duty vehicles, commercial vehicles. Obviously, we do car application as well. Now, each water pump has a different installation method. The seal between the engine and the pump is predefined and sensitive to alternative installation methods. When any gasket or O-ring, regardless of the construction material, is provided in the gate's kit, this should be the only seal between the water pump and the engine. 
The use of sealant to adhere a gasket or an O-ring to a water pump is unnecessary and can actually create pollution within the coolant circuit as the sealant breaks down. This will then eventually lead to premature failure of the water pump and the mechanical seal. People see sealant as it seals the gasket, but if the seal, if the if it squeezes out and it breaks down into the coolant system, it travels through the coolant system and it works its way between those mechanical seals, then what actually happens, it doesn't act as a sealant when it's in contact with a mechanical seal. It actually pushes the seal faces apart, which then obviously leads to premature failure of the mechanical seal and continuous leakage or weepage from the water pump. So sealant should only be used if it is specifically recommended by the vehicle OE manufacturer. Here we can see just a few examples of gaskets uh, that have been used over the years and that are supplied within Gates kits that contain water pumps and the heavy duty water pumps. We can have O-rings or shaped O-ring rubber seal gaskets. We can have paper, paper and steel gaskets in some cases we have a paper gasket which has a, a metal crush ring which acts as a seal when it's obviously the, uh, the fixing bolts are tightened up. And we can also have something known as an ECST or PTFE gaskets, which these type of gaskets have a rubberized um, material on both sides of the gasket. Now, the gasket supplied with the Gates water pumps will be to the same material standards as the what's supplied at OE level. But we, we only need to use the seal. There's no need to be using any silicon sealant to uh, hold the gaskets in place, etc. Okay, so when, when we're installing a new water pump, we need to use the new seal or gasket that's applied with the pump. We do not need to use any sealant or grease during the installation of the gasket in the seal. Now, in a lot of cases, I know a lot of guys say, well, when you push the pump into the aperture in the engine, if the seal's dry, that's why we use a grease or some form of silicon because it helps to uh, stop the seal from riding off the, uh, off the pump. In these particular cases, we can use, uh, apply a thin film of the new coolant. Remember, the coolant has got glycol. Glycol acts as a lubricant and it'll aid in the fitting process of, the, of a dry seal into the aperture on the engine. Now here we can see some cases which we, we've had come back through their warranty department where, as we said previous, excessive use of sealant, the sealant breaks down, it flows through the system, and obviously the, the water pump is circulating the coolant through the system and anything that may be contained within the coolant. If sealant gets in between the mechanical seal faces, as you can see here, then obviously it's a lot thicker and it causes the seal faces to be pushed apart. Once the seal faces are pushed apart, regardless if you've got hydraulic pressure from the coolant and the spring force in the mechanical seal, it will not uh, be able to cause the seal to seal correctly, and it will act as leakage paths continuous leakage, water pump needs replacing, and the system would need flushing because there could also be other sealant contaminated within the system. Okay, so when we install in the pump, we need to obviously ensure that the engine aperture is clean. There's no contamination present. Locate the pump into the engine aperture. Ensure the, the water pump housing is seated correctly so it's square and true. It's not at an angle. Install the fixing bolts first finger tight. In some cases, people put one bolt in and tighten one bolt up and then put the other bolts in after. This can cause the pump to kick at an angle. And people think that when they put the other, the other two, three bolts, whatever it may be, in, that it's going to pull it square. It doesn't always work. So we need to install the pump, make sure it's square and true, install the fixing bolts finger tight first, and then we need to torque the fixing bolts to the rec recommended vehicle manufacturer's specificated torque settings. If we over-tighten the bolts, we can cause damage to the bolts, breakage to the bolts in one respect, 
but also if we over tighten, we can actually cause fouling of the impeller because the, the gap between the impeller and the engine apertures is very, very small, obviously to get the pressure and the circulation of the coolant. So we need to ensure that we're installing these pumps with the correct tightening torques as recommended by the vehicle manufacturers. So when the pump is correctly installed, using the correct torque settings, the correct gaskets, et cetera, that are supplied. Obviously, then we need to proceed um, and fill the cooling system with the good quality recommended coolant um, by the vehicle manufacturer. So here we can see, as the coolant level's filling up, the cross-section of the water pump, the coolant started to circulate into the pump. And even when the system is full, when the coolant system's full, the pump is full of coolant, but at this point, the mechanical seal is not yet formed. When we say form, we need to ensure that coolant has been drawn in between the two seal faces prior to engine startup. So in exploded view, we can see here, we should see a green band between the two sealing rings. At this point, we can see that the, the green, in this particular case, we've got green coolant all around the mechanical seal. But in between the two seal faces, we have a blue section. We need to get this green coolant into the blue sections to ensure that this protective film is protecting the mechanical seal faces. So how do we do that? So when the system's full, we've got the coolant back in, we need to rotate the pump at least 10 turns by hand. This will then start to draw the, the coolant into the mechanical seal. You can just about see there's a green, small green band starting to form. And then after the 10 turns or more, you can see the green band, which means that the seal has now made. And there is a protective film of coolant between the two sealing faces, the mechanical seal faces, the static ring seal, and that dynamic ring seal. So as I said previous earlier on in the presentation, dripping during the running in period is normal and the dripping will occur. There's coolant still present within the seal chamber. The dripping or the weeping from the weep hole, this section, into the weep hole chamber where it collates but this dripping will stop when the seal is formed. We can see, as we said previous, these blue bits were between the two seals is now green. So there's a, a film of coolant between the two seal faces protecting the seal and the seal is formed. The seal chamber is now empty. The coolant has stopped weeping from the weep hole and into the weep hole chamber. As you said, you can see the seal is formed because it's now we've got the green coolant in between the sealing ring faces. The dripping has stopped, but any coolant that has dripped and weeped into the weep hole chamber reservoir will evaporate as obviously the engine warms up to normal operating temperature. However, if we have contaminated coolant in the system, as we can see, from the brown sort of colored liquid in this particular picture. The contaminated coolant can may contain particles. It may even contain uh, any silicate that's be, if it's silicate's been used and it's traveled through the system. There could be rust, there could be scale, but contaminated coolant, the contaminated coolant gets drawn in between the seal faces. The contaminants, whether it's hard particles, etc., cause damage to those seal faces. We get continuous weepage from the weep hole into the weep hole chamber reservoir. And when the reservoir becomes full, as you can see here, then the vent hole at the top of the weep hole chamber obviously starts to leak. And then we will get continuous weepage. And the telltale sign is a discolored bleed, watermark bleed uh, down the side of the water pump and down the engine. And this is the telltale sign that the mechanical seal has failed and we can see the discoloured watermarks of the contaminated coolant which has caused the issue. 
This is why we, we wanted to start flushing the systems more and more prior to water pump installation, preferably using the Gates Power Clean Flush Tool, as you can see, part number 91002. Comes with a range of various uh, fitments and uh, bungs for the different uh, size systems. But we need to get as much contamination out of the system prior to any new water pump installation. So as we said, coolant is a critical component within the system and coolant technology and the chemistry of coolants has evolved over the years. So the cooling system contains many different metals, as we all know, and the metals incorporated within cooling systems, we can have iron, engine blocks, copper thermostats, aluminium radiator and heater cores, and the coolants the formulations have evolved over the years to protect these different types of materials. And the coolant ma manufacturers have had, got new technologies to aid with specific systems. So the coolant chemistry, many different chemicals and additives and inhibitors are used in manufacturing engine coolant. Now, these additive packs make up around 5% of the actual coolant. And there are three main classes of coolant technology, which is known as IAT, OAT, and HOAT. However, there are many chemical combinations, formulas, and colors that are used to produce coolants today. There's no universal color for each specific type of technology. Years, in, in years gone by, it used to be if you took a green coolant out, you put green back in. If you took blue out, you put blue back in. The color now, there's all the colors of the rainbow, and it does not donate which technology of coolant is being used. So IAT is inorganic additive technology, OAT is organic additive technology, and the HOAT is a hybrid additive technology, which is a mixture of basically IAT and OAT. But the chemicals that are used to produce the hybrid organic additive, the HOATs, are specifically blended by chemists who know what chemicals in IAT and OAT formulations can be mixed together to produce a HOAT or hybrid additive technology um, coolants. So the coolant chemistry, one or more different type of corrosion inhibitors may be found in different types of coolant. And these corrosion inhibitors and additives from one coolant technology can negatively affect inhibitors held within another type of coolant technology. Just as an example, we can see silica protects aluminium while borate corrodes it. Now, corrosion could begin well before 6,000 miles into a water pump's life. So a vehicle could be back in the garage, a leaking pump, clogged heater core, clogged radiator, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the big problems is around 70% of intermixing of an incompatible coolant during what we call the topping off or the topping up uh, during services or during maintenance checks of weekends, whatever it may be, can lead to contamination of the coolant. If we mix incompatible coolants, we can actually cause issues, chemical reactions within the system, which cause issues silicates to drop out of the substance, of the coolant substances, and these, substance, these um, silicates that drop out are like gel, gel type substances, which can cause damage throughout the system. Now, one thing we need to be aware of with commercial vehicles is the coolant technology that's been used over the years is slightly different to some of the car sort of applications. With car, applications it's been you buy one container and that's what the container that you use to put into the system with commercial vehicles the the a couple of types of systems that are used one could be um the coolant is used the same as a car but the same style as a car supplied in a container which you just pour directly into the uh, the cooling system it contains glycol and the inhibitors or the SCAs, supplement coolant additives. But in a lot of cases, some of the coolants that have been used for commercial vehicles, 
The coolant only contains the glycol aspect for the freezing and boiling point uh, temperatures of the coolants and SCAs or supplemental coolant additives, the inhibitors are added separately. Um, so we need to ensure we know which type of system is, is, is used on the vehicle, which type of coolant's used. Um, but this is just a little, little bit of an intro into um, some of the differences with these SCA inhibitors. As we said, there are many different additives, packages and inhibitors, but the aim is to protect the engine, the cooling system against corrosion, erosion, cavitation and scale. These additives help to buffer the coolant solution from an acidic pH level to an alkaline pH level. When a lot of these coolants are manufactured, they generally tend to be slightly on the acidic side. So by buffering the pH to an alkaline, obviously we don't want an acidic solution flowing through the system, acid corrodes metals, etc. So by buffering to an alkaline, we bring the level down to a pH level. Now, we need to ensure that the correct SCA levels are maintained, where, you know, depending on which type of coolant, respectively, of which type of coolant is being used, whether it's coolant with additives already in or whether it's coolant where the SCAs are added. Uh, we have to maintain the correct SCA levels. There are different types of SCA available. So the different types, we can either have a liquid format, which is supplied in bottles or drums, and normally this is added directly into the cooling system, the expansion bottle, the radiator. And we can also get what we call pre-chemical charge pellets, which are contained within a coolant filter type cartridge. Now these filter cartridges are available with different rates of chemical release relating to longer or shorter system maintenance requirements. Now incorrect SCA levels can cause irreversible engine damage such as cavitation, damage to water pumps and cylinder liners. And we need to be aware, we need to check the vehicle manufacturer's coolant supply and, and the coolant supplier's data for the correct specifications of coolant and or the SCA requirements. So different types, as you said before, different types of coolant exist, IAT, OAT and HOAT type technology. And it is essential to use the correct coolant type to prevent coolant contamination within the cooling system. So coolant filters are also available with and without the pre-charged pellets containing the SCA additives. So with commercial vehicles, there's a little bit extra uh, investigation to do to understand which type of system is fitted um, before obviously installing the, um, the coolant and coolant additives, the SCAs, et cetera. So the coolant filter types, we can have a blank filter. So we have a filter element, which is contained within a metal outer casing. Obviously there's a seal to seal it against the engine. And we can have pre-charged SCA chemicals. We still have the, the filter element and these contain enough SCA chemicals and additives to charge the cooling system until first service interval. So here we can see the pre-charged SCA chemical pellets in the lower part of the filter. Now, depending on um, what the service intervals may be, uh, if the vehicle's out on you know, extended lengthy runs, et cetera, on trips and journeys, it may be that we need another type of filter which incorporates more uh, pre-charged SDA chemical pellets. As you can see, we have a smaller filter, but we have more of the pellets because obviously they're char these pellets are charged with the SDA chemicals. But in all cases, obviously, we need to check the OEM cap compatibility sorry, before fitment. So we need to in, un, you know, understand what the systems are, what's fitted originally, what can be fitted if we need to, um, to lengthen the service intervals etc. Obviously all this information will be available from the OEMs and from the, uh, the coolant uh, manufacturers and the SCA inhibitor manufacturers. Some of the other things that need to be done for system maintenance, a ref refractometer such as gates part number 91001 should be used for obviously checking the glycol concentrations of the coolant, so freezing points and boiling points, which helps to also eliminate risk of engine damage. 
uh, but it can also be a refractometer can also be used to measure the state of charge uh, for the electrolyte in lead acid be- lead acid batteries. Excuse me. However, this uh, refractometer does not check the status of additives in the inhibitors package. We need to use a, what we call a pH meter or pH strips to check the pH levels of the coolant to monitor the condition of the additive the additives in the in, in the inhibitor package. So coolants will generally have a pH range between 8.5 and 10.5. And also uh, a, a coolant system pressure tester, such as gauge part number 31367, should be used for checking pressure test in the system, obviously to check for leakage, et cetera. But this uh, pressure test can also be used to find if the if the radiator cap expansion bottle caps are faulty, um, they're not working at the correct pressures, etc. And the uh, there are a range of adapters that, that which are available separately for truck, bus, coach, and car applications. So a mixture of all these uh, these tests should be done, and um, to maintain the calling system correctly. Effects of mixing incorrect coolants. So coolant contam- when we say coolant contamination, everybody always thinks that contamination is from rust scale hard particles that may be within the coolant circuit within the system. But coolant contamination, as I said previously, can also occur when incorrect coolants have been mixed in the cooling system during topping off, topping up the system, is, can generally be the cause. So these chem- what happens is we get chemical reactions causing silicates or phosphates to separate and fall out of the coolant solution, which then deposits like a, a gel substance within the cooling system. This gel-like substance obviously can damage radiators, heat to cause and water pumps. There's two big sieves within a, within a cooling system. We have the, the main radiator and we have the heater core. Obviously with all the, uh, the small capillaries that run through these radiators, if we get gel in the system because the silicates have dropped out, then the gel will be filtered and sieved out by the radiators, heat cores, etc. We can have heating issues, the uh, engines overheating, or we can also have, or and or, we can have issues with uh, no heat coming into the cab uh, of the driving area. We can also get glycol degradation, which is loss of corrosion protection also occurring. So as we said previous in the uh, presentation, one of the telltale signs of a failed uh, mechanical seal is discolorated uh, coolant bleed marks around the weep hole area. And the cause, as I said, is coolant contamination in one form or another which has caused the mechanical seal to fail. And then we get the weepage from the weep hole. The solution is obviously to thoroughly flush the cooling system before installing a new water pump and refill the system with the correct vehicle manufacturer's recommended coolant and SCAs if required, etc. And never dry run a water pump. Dry running the pump can damage the mechanical seal. As we said previously, the coolant contains a glycol. Glycol has very good lubricating and cooling capabilities. So rust and corrosion, if this appears on the surface of the pump, um, uh, impellers, etc., obviously it will make the uh, less effective in moving the, in circulating the coolant. And contamin- this can be due to contaminated coolant, non-compatible coolant, or intermixing of the different types of coolant uh, chemistries and technologies. Another possible cause may be a defective pressure cap. As we've said, we can use a pressure test tool to test the system, to test the caps. Um, if we get if the cap's defective, causing air bubbles in the system, then this will obviously accelerate the rusting process because we're going to get oxidization occurring because of air in the system. Obviously, solution, replace the pump again, thoroughly flush the cooling system before installing a new pump, use the correct vehicle manufacturer's recommended coolant, 
and also inspect the pressure cap and replace if defective. One of the other big problems, especially with commercial vehicles, we can get cavitation. This can occur on around by the water pump, but it can also occur in cylinder liners, which can be used within the, uh, within the engine. And these are vapor cavities or bubbles in the coolant, which collapse with explosive force. And it causes something called pop mark in the pumps, individual components. In this case, you can see the body of the pump has been affected and the pop mark areas will then corrode because there's no actual uh, protection from the coolant and the inhibitors to protect the metal surfaces. So these form the formation of the bubbles of the, of the coolant inlet side of the pump. As the pressure increases in the system, the bubbles implode and cause harm, as you can see. So it can be due, due to insufficient coolant inhibitors. The inhibitors are depleted, which are no longer protecting, as I said previous. The solution, replace the pump. Again, thoroughly flush the cooling system. Refill the system with the correct vehicle manufacturer's recommended coolant. So some best practices when carrying out repairs within the cooling system, we obviously need to flush the system completely, preferably using the Gates Power Clean Flush Tool. We need to fill the system with the correct coolant and antifreeze, or coolant antifreeze, same thing. And obviously we need to bleed the system to ensure the cooling system is free of air. Now in some cases, some modern systems may require diagnostic equipment to help within the bleeding process. But obviously all this would be information would be from the vehicle manufacturers if you uh, require diagnostic equipment to bleed these type systems correctly. Also, when carrying out repairs on the cooling system, coolant hoses, turbo hoses, thermostat housings, etc., dry belt systems, are all generally removed to gain access to the water pump. So during the removal process of these components, it's always best practice to check the condition of the parts and replace as necessary. So you're not having to do the job twice or three times. Now you can use gatesautocap.com, which is Gates online cataloging system to check for all the commercial vehicle component requirements. Now, one of the things, as you said, that's removed is the micro-V belt. Now, how do we know if the belt's in good condition or bad condition? Well, Gates has got a what we call a Gates ABDS wear indicator tool, part number 0094-15003. Now, you may just be able to see you've got a serrated edge here and a serrated edge here. On the section here on the tool, it says belt, and this section, it says pulley. So this can be used for measuring the, the ribs of the belt, and this can be used for measuring the ribs on the pulley because the pulley also wears, there may be plastic pulleys, metal pulleys, they all still wear over a period of time. Okay, so when we use the tool, we place the tool into the grooves on the belt and we apply sideways, backward, or sideways movement from side to side. A lot of people think, oh, it's like a comb and you check along the grooves of the belt. That's not correct. As you can see, as the tool's been used here, side to side, side to side movement is showing that there's excessive play between all of the ribs on the belt, which means the belt is worn. So we need to stop. If we installed this belt as it is, the one that's been tested, we would get something called rib topping because the belt ribs aren't, ma aren't mating with the pulley ribs correctly so we'll get movement from side to side on the on the pulley now just five percent of belt wear can make a belt slip especially when it's under load a correctly mating belt so when the um, the sides of the, the ribs are in good condition they mate with the ribs on the pulley so we get 100% contact and we don't get the side to side movement. So by using this tool, we can make, we can establish whether the belt is worn or not. So please remember 
the wear gates wear indicator tool for micro V belts or serpentine type belts, part number 0094-15003. Now Gates Fleet Runner range, which is for the specialist range for truck and bus, truck coach and bus actually, contains a V belts, power band V belts, power band notched V belts, micro V belts, and call runner belts. The call runner belt belts are used for vehicles which use uh, refrigeration systems on the vehicles. Gates Fleet Runner also range also consists of belt kits which contain belt and tensioners and idler pulleys, tensioners and idler pulleys uh, separately, box separately. Also, calling hoses, turbo hoses, fuel line hoses for uh, truck and bus, and also thermostats. And obviously, the range is now including water pumps as we've seen previously. As I said. Earlier on, gatesautocat.com is Gates' online catalogue system to check by vehicle make, model, part number, if you have a Gates part number or if you have a competitor number or a vehicle manufacturer's OE number, you can enter the number into the system to get to the Gates, to do a cross-reference to get to a Gates part number. What we need to ensure when we check in for commercial vehicles, you can see the icon here is highlighted heavy duty. If we want car, or motorbike, we have to click on individual separate icons. But for fleet runner products, we need to click the heavy duty and then we can make the regular, the, the uh, relevant searches. Gates also has a mobile app which can be downloaded onto tablets or smartphones, uh, free to download either from the Apple App Store or Google Play, depending on the operating system of your tablet or smartphone. Once downloaded, you can get the same information that's contained within the online catalogue system, which you generally use a PC for. But the beauty of this is when you've got the app on the phone, if you're having trouble locating a part or uh, viewing a part, you can get a picture of the gates part, as you can see here on, or here, on the phone or on your tablet while you're standing at the vehicle or you're underneath the vehicle to marry up the components to, to ensure you get in the right part sent. And we also have Gates Tech Zone, which is Gates Online Technical Information Center, as you can see, which is gatestechzone.com. You just need to ensure you select the correct language, select products, heavy commercial vehicles, and then you'll get the drop down list, which shows the range of parts available. Also within the gatestechzone.com there is a download center where when you click it will ensure you've selected the correct uh, language click on the downloads tab at the top up here and then you'll see brochures catalogs and manuals that are available to download and here are just some examples of the pages contained within these downloads so you can download downloads as a PDF file, which you can view online and view on your, your, your PC, your, your smartphone, whatever it may be. Or, and you can also print off, print these pages off, um, depending on what you actually want to do with, with the information. Okay, so uh, just a reminder on some of the websites available, we've got www.gates. Uh, dot gates dot com. We've got www.gatesautocat.com, which is the Gates online cataloging system. And we've also got the www.gatestechzone.com, which is Gates Technical Information Center, online technical information center. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much to everybody that's attended this morning. Um, I don't know if there's been any questions come through or anything on the chats at the moment. Uh, just a quick message to everyone uh, on the gatestechzone.com. Uh, there is a, the live webinar tab, which you're obviously all probably aware, well aware of now. Um, just keep checking on there for uh, there should be some updates coming up shortly for future 
uh, webinars that we'll be holding in the future. So, okay, guys, well, thank you to everyone again who's attended and uh, we'll hopefully see you shortly in the future at another webinar. Uh, thanks, and I hope you all have a good weekend and keep safe, everyone. Thanks, and bye for now.